Welcome to the discussion dining room. Um, I'm Andrew Sarkar, we're openly disruptive. Um, we're all about helping people do disruptive innovation, so how to understand how technology, culture, and commerce coming together and all the changes that are going on right now. I don't know how to be the future. So thanks for being with us today. Thank you for our sponsorship. Aaron is a, is a doctoral student in Missouri Science and Technology, and at the same time, thinks of himself as an entrepreneur. So he's helping create kind of this you know, next generation additive manufacturing equipment to do some really fantastic high temperature and very exotic kinds of things. And then also has an eye to what kind of business do I want to start? And so uh, we talked and uh, thought it would be interesting to ask him to present here are three, or, I'm sorry, 10, maybe 10, right? So go on 10. I've got he's more of it. He's got more of it. We, uh, we came up with this 10 kinds of additive manufacturing businesses you might be able to launch. Um, so let's think a little bit about what kinds of businesses might we see. You know, and if you, you know, what kinds of businesses, what kinds of new vendors might you see in your uh, in your community, and new capabilities might you see in the next three to ten years? So, without further ado, Aaron Thornton. Good afternoon. Um, so I'll be presenting some uh, emerging business ideas with 3D printing and additive manufacturing technology. Um, <clears throat> all of these business ideas I'm about to share are potential markets for AM technology. Uh, basically ways in which we, someone really could make some money. Uh, a, little bit of back, a little bit of background about myself. I am a PhD student at Missouri S&T. Uh, I'm the project lead on the free swimmer extrusion fabrication process is an additive manufacturing process in which we can uh, print ceramic and metal parts. Um, one of the cool things about this process is that if you can make a paste, we can print it. It's kind of a neat, it's kind of a neat process. Back in August, I, I started a company called Tenica AM, and the end goal of this, of this company is to eventually start an additive manufacturing center here in the St. Louis area, where we, where we provide a wide variety of parts for a wide variety of customers with a wide variety of machines that you can see I've, I've uh, come up with here. <clears throat> so onto the business ideas themselves. Um, we can actually print bone scaffolding out of bioactive glass. And these bone scaffolds can be inserted into you to help assist with bone, damaged bone, uh, broken bone, missing bone repair. That is awesome, okay? <clears throat> uh, moving on, we can also print cells into matrices. In the future, we can now print tissues, and we, we fully expect to be able to print organs in the near future. So imagine your, your liver fails. You'll be able to go to the hospital, they'll print you a new liver, and implant it into you. That's pretty awesome, too. <coughs> dental crowns. Um, I think this was shared a little bit before, but we can now print ceramic dental crowns. These used to actually be machine, and due to their complex geometry, it's easy to see why AM technology would be a, a much better method of, of uh, fabricating things. <clears throat> we, uh, medical instruments and surgical tools are also an excellent candidate. They're often produced in low production runs, and a lot of times they're just weird, uh, complex geometry to them, such as the turbo squid you can see here. So they, they're, they're, they're not cost effective to produce through uh, conventional manufacturing methods. <clears throat> The aerospace industry is huge into uh, th uh, 3D printing additive manufacturing. Boeing, Lockheed, and NASA are all putting printed parts on their flight vehicles, including passenger jets. Okay? Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about that some more, but I kind of ran out of room. There's a whole lot more to that I could go into. Uh, many, many machining centers and uh, manufacturing facilities are really are not taking advantage of this particular area right here. You can save lots and lots of money by printing jigs and fixtures rather than the conventional methods of machining them or fabricating or stamping them. You can, uh, most of this was taken directly from the Stratus' website. There's a lot of money, a lot of potential money to be made and to be saved there. Uh, we can also print molds with fairly high detail and accuracy. We can print mold negatives, mold positives, vacuum forming molds. Uh, once again, this is much more cost effective versus traditional manufacturing methods such as machining. <clears throat> The automotive and racing, racing industries um, are also printing parts and putting them directly on their vehicles. So you can see it on the upper right, uh, the, the first 3D printed uh, race car. 
from a university in Belgium. You can see on the left, Audi produced what they claim to be the first uh, printed uh, show car. <clears throat> Uh, we can actually print really complex, full-color 3D figurines, objects, sculptures, whatever it may be. We can print random toys, board game pieces, dollhouse pieces. Um, I really think that this right here is actually a huge potential market for AM technology, which right now is relatively untapped. Um, for anyone willing to get a secret clearance, there's a lot of potential work to be done with the Department of Defense. Uh, whether you're working directly with the DOD or other DOD contractors such as, once again, Boeing and Lockheed or even Raytheon, they're heavily looking into including AM technology into their, into their uh, defense contracts. We can print circuit boards. Uh, right now we can print uh, plastic backing and make all the circuit connections with, with, by printing the solder. In the near future, we fully expect to be able to print real circuit boards out of silicone and, and copper, uh, much like the ones we see now. Jewelry, we can print really high detail wax jewelry which can then be cast into precious metals. The fashion industry has recently become pretty big into um, fashion, plastic fashion accessories, printing fashion accessories such as bracelets, rings, necklaces, uh, even shoes. I don't know about you all, but that looks really uncomfortable. <laughs> we, we, can, we can print food, uh, cakes, uh, batters, doughs, chocolates, frostings. A lot of catering companies are using foods at their banquets, to, or, and they're, they're, they're using printing technology to print foods, decorative foods, for their banquets and, and uh, events. Now before I end, I just want you to brainstorm with me, with me a little bit. Think about it for a moment. If someone were to market, put on the market tomorrow in a, a teleportation machine, how would that change your society? How would the, tra the, the transportation of goods and people change? Okay, I propose that additive manufacturing could be, and is very likely to be, an indirect form of teleportation. Think about it for a moment. We can take a CAD file from any computer and send it anywhere else in the world where it can then be fabricated. So you are indirectly teleporting that, that object. Uh, this goes along the lines of what, what uh, our previous speaker spoke about. Um, so the reason why we're not doing this now, in my opinion, is because the cost of tooling. The cost to tool up a bunch of small manufacturing centers all over the place is so high that it actually, it's actually cheaper to ship these physical parts throughout the world. I really think that additive manufacturing is going to change that. We're going to see a lot more small uh, printing centers in every major community throughout the world. And I, think that's the, I think that's where AM is going. Um, once again, I'm Aaron Thornton. Thank you. Aaron uh, talks about it in his is like, you know, so toys and games and parts and things like that. And, and, and uh, I have to say, you know, the first time I heard somebody say that, I'm like, oh, is there really that much money to be made? I mean, you know, how much of a business is that? And uh, Kirk, the lawyer who uh, wrote up the paper that we did the interview with, so we'll just think about this. All of those things, those are extremely hard. You know, the cost of a toy is far great, is far lower than the $20. You're paying $20 for that toy for the IP of that toy. So you already conditioned yourself to think about intellectual property. If you now, you know, you can no longer play, you know, whatever game it is because your kids lost whatever part it was. If you have the ability to get that part back and, and, and basically re replace that game for $5 instead of paying $20 for a new one, that kind of starts changing some things where you start getting to additive manufacturing isn't a special thing that somebody might do. It's just on your list of chores for the weekend. Along with the dry cleaning, I gotta get the six more Lego blocks that connect the battery pack because the kid keeps losing those. Um, and when you think about it from that perspective, it's it's really a little bit different. 